uh, being the quintessential BBC man uh, goes down particularly well in St. Gallen. We'll see over the next hour, won't we? Um, it's fantastic for me to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, most particularly because of um, the guest that I'm about to invite onto the stage. Uh, Jean-Claude Trichet is a man who, in a sense, I've been pursuing for some time to get him on to my own BBC show, Hard Talk. Um, of course, when he was president of the European Central Bank and in the months since he left, he's been a little cautious, a little cagey in the months since. In a sense, I think there's a bit of a tradition of purder that when a a central banker leaves a very important post. He feels that he needs to be quiet for a little bit of time to allow his successor to settle in before beginning the process of second guessing, if there is any second guessing to be done. And that's one of the things I perhaps will be exploring a little bit over the next 45 minutes. So without further ado, let me invite onto the stage a man you all know very well, Jean-Claude Trichet. And Jean-Claude, you take take the chair there. I will sit down over here. Um, I said that you need very little introduction. I'm just going to very quickly remind people of the way in which Jean-Claude has been at the, the center of the European economic banking financial story for more than two decades. Um, it's worth remembering, I think, that before he took over at the European Central Bank, he was running the French Central Bank, the Banque de France, and just it reminded me, I was looking on the internet the, the, the other day, that he had this wonderful title that one journalist at one time described you as the Ayatollah of the Frank Four. Now, first of all, I've never seen a man look less like an Ayatollah, but also I love the delicious irony that having been the Ayatollah of the Frank Four, you then became the architect, one of the key architects of uh, Europe's common currency. And of course, that means we have a whole lot to talk about today. You're also a very keen sailor, and it, it struck me that it's a wonderful metaphor, you out there off the coast of San Malo doing your sailing as you love. And I'm sure in the period after you took over at the ECB, maybe 03, 04, you were sort of seeing yourself sailing into these very calm, wonderful waters. And then, my God, in 08, 09, 10, you have navigated through the most incredible storms. You've had to lash yourself to the mast and deal with events which you couldn't have predicted, nobody could have predicted. So, in the spirit of sticking to the theme, the theme of facing risk, I want to start with this question. Actually, no, I don't want to start with this question because I've forgotten something very important, classic, um, present a mistake. Can I, before we go any further, and before Jean-Claude opens his mouth, and I know that's what we're really here for, can I just... <laughs> Can I just remind everybody, including myself, that this is a democratic process, and we do have um, a vote. We want to take the mood of the floor before we begin our conversation. We have a very simple question that we want you to vote on. I hope it's going to come up on the screens. Um, the proposition is this. I hope it's going to come up. I'm going to carry on anyway. Here we go. Can the Eurozone survive in its current form? Now, I think you've already been told how to vote. Uh, it's simple, you can send a text message, uh, and there are different messages you can send. For yes, it's S42Y, and for no, it's S42N. That sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Or you can go uh, to the website with the... <laughs> yeah, well, let's not preempt, let's not prejudge, let's not be hasty, you see? It's going to be interesting. What we're going to do is allow that to build up over the next few minutes. Jean-Claude will keep half an eye on it while he's, while he's talking to me, and we'll see where the mood of the room sits. Of course, the vote may change as Jean-Claude continues his thoughts. Uh, we've got one more vote coming up at the end, so you know, enjoy this democracy while you can. As Mr. Papandreou told us earlier, democracy has a long tradition and is hugely important, so we're sticking with that idea. Anyway, that's that. We also are going to have time for questions. After I've done mine, I'm more than aware that, you know, we've got leaders of today, we've got leaders of tomorrow, we've probably got leaders of the day after tomorrow in this room. Um, a lot of brain power. It's a bit intimidating for a guy like me, because I think your questions are going to be a whole lot smarter than mine. So uh, after I've had my go with Jean-Claude, uh, he is very happy to take questions from the floor. So that's the way this uh, next 45 minutes or so 
is going to unfold. But allow me then to get back to my opening thought, that of risk. Is it fair, Jean-Claude, to say, and will you now say, that you misjudged the level of risk involved in creating Europe's common currency? Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, this uh, opportunity to communicate. Uh, I must say that uh, I came in St. Gallen 18 years ago, immediately after having been appointed uh, governor of Banque de France. And then I had 10 years of governorship of Banque de France and then eight years in the ECB. So I'm back 18 years afterwards. Uh, a lot of things have changed over that time. Uh, let's say that to understand what's happening in Europe, it's important to realize that it is one episode in a global crisis of the advanced economy. As you said very rightly, things started for the advanced economy in 07. And you might remember we were the first central bank to be very, very active in non-conventional measures in August 07. Then we had the Lehman Brothers crisis, and uh, it was in a way the second episode of this global crisis of the advanced economy. There I have to say that the mainstream of the economists, most practically the totality of the decision makers, did not suspect ex ante that the fragility of the global financial system would be that big. At that time, some Europeans were saying, this is a US problem. The subprime are in the US, Lehman Brothers is in the US. It was but only... The name Sarkozy comes to mind. It, well, I, mean, I would say it was uh, some kind of spontaneous mistake, which was made by a number of Europeans, uh, not only one person, but certainly many. And uh, uh, it proved, of course, plain wrong. Uh, it was a global problem. By the way, the, the man you mentioned was very active in trying to get the G20, because it was a global problem, obviously. So we had, at that time, an epicenter of the global crisis of the advanced economy in the US, but it was a global crisis. And it was, in my own understanding, the second episode of this crisis. And then you had the third episode, which was the concentration of markets on the sovereign risk. We are in the third episode, which is the sovereign risk uh, crisis. The epicenter is in Europe. But as well as it was a big mistake to think that the US was only at stake when we had Lehman Brothers, I think it's a mistake to think that the Europeans are only at stake in this episode. We have an absolute necessity for all advanced economy, and of course, particularly in Europe, particularly in the euro area, to demonstrate that they are on a sustainable path as regards their macro policies and as regards their fiscal policies. And, but that, that's a problem that we have to cope with and to think that we can ignore it in any part and parcel of the constituency of the advanced economy would be a mistake. I quite understand why you've begun by setting it in the context of uh, all of the global economic issues that we've seen un unravel since 07. But I come back to a basic question. I, I, it, it surely is not your contention that Europe's sovereign debt crisis would not have happened without the financial meltdown that we saw in 07, 08, is it? Well, no, I am only mentioning the fact that without the crisis, the fault lines or the weaknesses of all advanced economy macro policy would not have appeared. They would have uh, uh, been hidden for a certain period of time. Uh, the benefits, if I may, the positive in a crisis is that it is like X-ray or a scanner. It reveals the problem you might have. And uh, well, that, that, to, right. to an extent which is remarkable, because when I look at the advanced economy, look at Canada, look at Sweden, look at Germany in a way. These are three countries which proved an extraordinary resilience to the crisis. They were not touched, really, by the crisis. Uh, unemployment did not augment in a number of countries. Uh, Canada was uh, cl very close to the US and resisted admirably to the crisis. Why? Because they had problems before. 
They had problems at the end of the 80s in Canada. They had problems at the beginning of the uh, 90s in Sweden. Germany had the reunification and all the problems associated with loss of competitiveness. A hard work was done to adjust, and this adjustment proved the best way to obtain resilience in but, the crisis. Sure, but I, I love your metaphor of the X-ray and the X-ray exposing weaknesses. And surely the weakness that has been exposed in Europe and that we have to live with every day now is that we moved toward this hugely ambitious project, the Euro, Economic and Monetary Union, without delivering the political means to make it strong, sustainable, and truly viable in the long term. There I would, uh, I agree with you, of course. Again, uh, the X-ray is revealing things that were not fully understood before. But let me say that as regards the Central Bank in particular, uh, we said from the very beginning that the Stability and Growth Pact, for instance, and it was mentioned by Georges Papandreou earlier, the Stability and Growth Pact was essential. I said myself publicly a hundred times that we had not a full-fledged political uh, federation, that we didn't have a federal budget, and therefore that the framework of the Stability and Growth Pact was absolutely essential. And the politicians routinely ignored you. And we had a big problem, in particular in 2003 and 2004, because the major countries decided that it was not for them. And it created an immense problem. They refused to apply to themselves the Stability and Growth Pact, the big countries in Europe, including, I have to say, France and Germany Absolutely. and Italy. Then uh, there was a real battle. Uh, you might remember there was even a trial between the Commission and the Council. And we were absolutely adamant to say, you have to respect that framework. I would say also that uh, on top of that, uh, we insisted very, very much ourselves on the fact that the competitive indicators had to be followed very, very carefully in the euro area in particular, and that imbalances had to be followed very carefully. I circulated myself uh, every month the evolution of the unit labor cost in the euro area, drawing the attention of governments on the fact that it was extremely important to be very cautious and very attentive. So all this now is recognized. In a way, the question is not perfect, if I may. Can the eurozone survive in its current form? It has already decided to transform its current form, if I may. The Stability and Growth Pact has been uh, reinforced very significantly, as has been said this morning. And we have now the second pillar, the surveillance of uh, competitive indicators and imbalances that yes. is now embedded in the famous six packs. Uh, well, I take so your, I there take is your no point. If form. you truly believe that the, the fiscal treaty that all members accept, of course, good old UK, uh, have, have signed on for, if you accept that that is long-term credible, then you could make an argument that it's already made a decision to move on from its current form. But uh, surely that question gets to something somewhat more profound, which is that given the massive imbalances within the European economic zone, and of course we have to talk about Greece in particular, at least one, if not more, member states currently inside the Eurozone will have to leave. I don't trust that at all. Uh, it is not what uh, they have decided. I mean, the governments, uh, not technocrats, uh, the democracies. We are, have 17 democracies. The 17 democracies have clearly said that it was not the, 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 the way, the avenue that they would uh, consider appropriate. And a lot of decisions have been taken, not only, of course, the change of governance, which is extremely important, but also the uh, protection of the, of the euro area in a way which was unthinkable a year and a half ago and has been decided by our democracies in a learning by doing process. But let me perhaps say just one word because we are speaking of the euro. It's not the case in the question. I like the can the eurozone. The Eurozone, you said yourself, EMU, Economic and Monetary Union. But I would like very much to make the difference for one second between the Monetary Union, the Euro, the currency, mm. and the Economic Union, the governance of the Economic Union. If I take the Euro, imagine, uh, could you make the thought experiment 
13 years ago, I would have said here in this audience in St. Gallen, not 18 years ago, 13 years ago, we will make uh, the new currency, or 14 years ago, we'll make the new currency. That new currency will be issued for 17 countries and 332 million people. That currency will keep its value over 13 years, the first 13 years, remarkably well, with an inflation of 2.03% over 13 years. It would be better than what had been produced by national central banks in the best and most reliable economies in the 50 years before the euro was made, namely in the Netherlands, in Germany, in any country, you name it. And the sentiment of the markets would be as regards inflation expectations that this would continue for the next 10 years, so that 23 years would be covered by track records and by anticipation. But, but had, I, very had, same... had I said that, I guess <laughs> that the response would have been 99%, uh, no, it's impossible, 1%, yes. Had I added that this would be observed after five years of the worst crisis ever in the advanced economy, then the proportion would have been 100%, 0%. I'm sure of that. I but draw your attention to it. Had, had you... Had I added <laughs> that, that Switzerland would consider that it was not that bad... You would have needed to, to take have, a very big breath to, to get all of this out. some kind of relationship it, yeah. with the currency itself, again, it would have been so surprising. So again, but, but it, we, have, we have to have you, that in mind. Well, but I, I, the, yes, of course. And, on the other hand, I, I understand. On the other hand, I fully agree with you. On the necessity to improve dramatically the government. Yes, but the point is, there are many people, uh, Jean-Claude, including, it has to be said, people who sat alongside you on the board of the ECB, who frankly, in private, if not in public, have told me that they now have come to the conclusion that Greece, in particular, cannot be sustained inside the euro. And the problem is that sometimes they can't speak out because all of the political issues surrounding that particular question. It is very sensitive, it is very Frankly difficult, but if, if the truth Fra is that, that Fra Greece Frank must leave, then surely at some point even you have to address no, that. I mean, I mean, frankly speaking, the fact that you consider that this is an open question, that the entire world has considered that this is an open question, when I, my own understanding is that it is a false question, and it is per perhaps as wrong a question as what I have mentioned as the attitude vis-à-vis -vis the euro currency, the currency of the euro when we started. We, we have to be clear on that. What has been done, what has been decided is very important. It's been decided by 17 democracies, which after all have proved their capacity uh, to realize uh, something which was considered uh, very, very difficult. Well, let, let's get, so if I may, let's, 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 let's get back. Let's on, have let's a minimum. Back, let's get may, back to the question may, of risk. A minimum of empathy, if I may. Well, and, I, I, and I, I don't, I mean, I know journalists have a reputation of being like <laughs> vultures sort of hovering over the carcasses of, of uh, fallen beasts, and I don't see the euro <laughs> as, a, as, a, as, a, as a carcass yet, but. but, but <laughs> Not but you but, but look, at the, look at the reality <laughs> that since you left, Jean-Claude, the ECB has had to pump a trillion euros into the European banking system. Now, that is an expansion of the balance sheet, an ex expansion of the risk that the ECB has taken on. And much of that money has gone into, for example, Spanish banks, which are then buying Spanish government bonds, spreading this sort of this toxic risk even more systemically through the European system. Could, you, are you happy with what you see since you've left and the degree to which things are being kicked down the road, but maybe in a way that's making them potentially more dangerous? First of all, let me mention the fact that uh, all central banks in the world, uh, the one that you know particularly well, I guess, Bank of England, have embarked on 
non-standard, non-conventional measures. And we have to reflect on that. What, what exactly is behind the fact that the Federal Reserve, that the Bank of England, that Bank of Japan, and that the ECB have all augmented their balance sheets and all with various means. But Subs all, of those all of those banks, na national, national reserve banks, except the Sub ECB. The ECB is responsible for the currency of uh, 332 I know, million but that, people. Th this is a circular item which takes us back to the uh, question of and economics and politics. And so if and I politics. understand well, the sins uh, are forgiven when it is a nation which is at stake and are not forgiven when it is uh, an entire continent. Is N it the idea? No, that's not the idea. But as you heard from Mr. Sulik, I think earlier, uh, the former speaker of the Slovakian parliament, he, he made a case, and it was perhaps compelling to some in the room, a case that when decisions are taken on a, on a national basis, with, backed by a fully functioning democracy, which people can identify with, they are much stronger decisions than t decisions taken okay, so in again, European institutions. No, let, let me, let me uh, draw your attention again on the fact, because you, you had a very clear question. All central banks in the advanced economy have embarked in non-standard measure. The paradox, perhaps, is that the augmentation of the balance sheets of the major central banks, which is due to monetary policy, has a little bit paradoxically perhaps been more modest in the ECB than in the other major central banks. But it means something. It means that since the start of the crisis, we are in a situation which is very complex. We are in a situation where market economies in the advanced constituency have uh, uh, not been able to maintain their normal functioning and central banks had to substitute partially to the normal functioning of the market. It's the case in all advanced economy. In the case of the European Central Bank, they, from the very beginning, and uh, I was the chair of the uh, board of, uh, of governors, we started with these non-conventional measures in uh, supplying liquidity on an unlimited basis at fixed rate. And we started that, to be clear, from the 9th of August 2007. We were the first central bank to embark in non-conventional measures. And then we did that on the duration of one week, one month, three months, six months, and one year. And the decision which has been taken after I left of the three years was, I trust, commensurate to the uh, gravity of the situation because all those non-standard measures have to be exactly commensurate to the fact that you have a market which is not functioning correctly, which is dysfunctional, which is unfortunately but today the case in all major economies. Well, you've explained why it happened, but does it not extend the danger of moral hazard? Well, I trust that it is done in all uh, countries, uh, in all major advanced economy, with the idea that, first, there is a situation, in the case of the European, it's very simple. We consider that we have to transmit our monetary policy in as appropriate a way as possible. When we have a major dysfunctioning of markets, then we intervene to try to re-establish a better, I, I wouldn't say an ideal, but a better transmission of the monetary policy. And in, as a matter of fact, we have to be sure that this is exactly commensurate to the dysfunctioning of markets and that it is transitory because it is done only to give time to the banks, the financial institutions, to put their house in order to the markets to get back to a normal functioning, and to the governments and well, public authorities, not only the uh, executive but branches, but also the parliaments, and also, of course, the surveillance authorities, and to do their job. Sure, and when you talk parliaments, you're ultimately talking about the people. And let me, I, I want to stop soon and, and allow questions from the audience, and I also just want to observe We've moved on, I'm sure people have realized much faster than I'm telling you, but we've moved on from can the Eurozone survive, and I believe fairly convincingly people felt, in its current form I should say, people felt it couldn't survive in its current form. 
We've now gone on to should Greece stay in the Eurozone, and those of you who are voting two-thirds to one-third at the moment are saying uh, no, it cannot stay in the Eurozone. So, Jean-Claude, you might want to reflect no, on... On the on first question, frankly speaking, it was not, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> the perfect question, because yeah. we well, have already uh, changed, and we are changing. All right, well, no, we, I mean, we they, get the message. And, and but, what, what, if we had the question, do you think that uh, the say the US, not to speak of any other country, should the US change its policy or not to re-establish credibility in the long run? I guess that it would be more or less the same response. We all have to put our house but, in order, uh, all of us. Understood. Now, I have to... S Hang on, I want to ask you a question. Um, you just talked there about, you know, the, the, the need for the banking system uh, and indeed for political leaders to uh, make the right decisions. And that, of course, includes peoples. Here's a thought for you. Your own nation is going to the polls in the second round of the presidential election this weekend. Greece also has elections this weekend. Now, I'm not going to prejudge the results, but all the indicators that we get from many nations across Europe is that um, dissatisfaction with the status quo is rising. Political extremes appear to be winning more support from people across Europe. And if one is looking for the kind of leadership that you've indicated is necessary to bring Europe out of this crisis, frankly, the prospects do not look particularly good. Mr. Hollande, for example, has already said he wants to ne negotiate the, the pact, which you've already referred to as being so very important uh, for Europe's immediate future. So how worried are you about the lack of political leadership right now? Well, I would say again, we are all living in exemplary democracies, and uh, particularly, I have to say, uh, in this country where you have so many referenda, uh, it is very, very impressive to see what, what's being done. I, I would say, all over the world, in the advanced economy, we have the same kind of uneasiness that you have mentioned. We have to be, to realize that this is something which uh, we have to understand better. My own understanding is, of course, that we are experiencing incredible transformation of the global economy, that the new emerging power like India, China, Brazil, you name it, uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, the uh, incredible success of all these countries is, of course, creating uh, uh, an adaptation challenge uh, for the advanced economy, which had had the monopoly of their own uh, uh, franchise, if I may, and creates, of course, the need to adapt more rapidly, I guess, that uh, the human beings, our fellow citizens, would like. And in a way, what we have to uh, understand fully is that we have to manage the successes that we have uh, uh, achieved. I mean, after World War II, the idea was precisely India and China should be as wealthy as we are. That was the purpose of the World Bank, the Bretton Woods Institution. We were extremely happy to see science and technology exploding, and they are remarkably achieving incredible results. I have the feeling myself that I experienced a science fiction novel because I have the memory of what was the state of technology when mm. I started to work. And of course, we have also the aging. All these successes are difficult to manage, obviously, and uh, our democracies are reflecting this difficulty. And could I just very gently bring you back to the question, which is <laughs> how worried are you right now when you look at your own country's politics and you look at the politics of Europe generally, that there isn't the political leadership there that is needed to fulfill your economic vision? I don't know whether the image which has been given by the European democracies, 17 democracies, on the one hand, in the euro area, and 27 democracies, exemplary democracies, uh, at the level of the Euro European Union as a whole, have given the sentiment that they were you know, very agitated in all directions. It might be the case, because democracies are transparent, then you can see the pros and cons of every, every issue in 17 format or 27 format. 
But if you look at the facts, if you look at the decisions, what do you see? You see that with all these discussions, and you had a lot of pros and cons in each of our democracies, we have the six packs, we have the new secondary legislation, which is already into force with an agreement of the Council and of the Parliament, the Open Parliament, which is elected by universal polling. And so we have democracy at the heart of Brussels. And I have to say, we have already a federal institution, which is the ECB, and we have a parliament, which is elected by universal suffrage. And the uh, way the parliament captures the European spirit is very impressive. I had always the sentiment that it was the real place, not surprisingly, the European Parliament, where you could feel the spirit of Europe. Yeah, I mean, now, I, now, I, I, now decisions have been taken. New decisions will have to be taken, in my opinion, because Europe is proceeding. Europe will not stop there. Europe will proceed. And I said myself that there was the Europe, yeah, you, you, European you, you, decisions you, you, of tomorrow and even the European You're using the same language you've used for years. Day I mean, after tomorrow. Back in 08, you said, you know, the euro is the most advanced feature of European unity. Yeah. And you're using the same language today you used then, but something has happened in the meantime which has been catastrophic. And <laughs> many people would say that nowadays... I, I always said... We need governance. We need a better governance. The European governments that are destroying the Stability and Growth Pact are plain wrong. We have to follow very carefully all the competitive indicators. But these governments I, are I democratic, right. and if the Greek I'm people... Sorry, I'm sorry, sir. I was right on the euro. I, I, uh, I did not insist on the fact that if you compare the value of the euro today with the value of the euro 13 years ago, vis-à-vis uh, -vis the dollar or the uh, sterling, it is a little bit higher. Well, so no, that, that, I, I don't that, insist on that. No, I... I, 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 my, I, I don't insist on that. My national pride isn't but, hurt, don't worry. But, 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 but to be honest with you, uh, talking about exchange rates and, and, and all of that is absolutely right and proper. No, no, but but uh, what does it mean to the people of Greece who are living with their fifth year of contraction and feel themselves to be in a system that will never allow them to be anything but a zombie economy? No, it's not true. We, we, we heard the previous Prime Minister of Greece, and he, he was, I have to say, very, very convincing, at least in my eyes. But, but uh, I but think the key word there is previous. But it's hard uh, work. It's hard work. And you have to know also that, very unfortunately, what we call dramatic austerity today is only a correction which is made because in the previous days, uh, nominal augmentations we are much too rapid and uh, without real link with economic reality. So this is a correction which is operating in Greece, which has been made in the Baltic states in a way which has been uh, very, very impressive, and which is made in Ireland too, where you, have this, you had the same problem of getting back to competitiveness through the appropriate uh, diminishing of labor unit cost and uh, competitive indicators. Well, and I that, that is something which is work in progress, hard work in progress. But why concentrating on, you know, this kind of things when we have a real issue, which is how do you improve governance of the euro area mm. and of Europe as a whole? Because the single market is also at stake. And the 27 have a, an immense stake in the single market. We have a tendency to renationalize a number of factors, to resegment the single market. It is true inside the euro area, and we have to combat that, but it is true also at the level of the single market of the 27 as a whole. So, again, as I said, we all have to reflect, put the house in order, not only on a, on a national basis, but also for the European at the level of the continent, the entire continent, including the UK, including the 27, and I have to say, well, it's also, I don't want to lecture anybody, but it's also the case in Japan, in the United States of America, in all advanced economies. After all, well, after all mm. we had Latin America in a difficult situation in the 80s. We had Africa in a difficult situation in the 80s. We had, as the, at the end of the 90s, Asia had to correct its own trajectory. And we thought, well, we advanced economy, that we are out of the hook that it was only for the others. Now it's our turn. Well, I, I, and we have I, to do the job. I, I'm going to 
stop you there. <laughs> and I, I am going to salute your indomitable optimism. And I'm also going to refer to the fact that there's been a late swing on our should Greece stay in the Eurozone poll. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Papandreou, <laughs> congratulations. Uh, <laughs> I've seen him, he's been texting like mad. He's cast, <laughs> he's, he's cast 35 votes in the last five minutes. Uh, it's working. Keep going, Prime Minister. Uh, no, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. This is a genuine democracy. Uh, now, look, I, I, I've had a go. I've had a bit of a go at uh, Jean-Claude, and, and um, you can all judge how far I got. Uh, but I now need the leaders of... of tomorrow, today, and the hereafter to uh, raise their hands with, with some questions because we're going to do the microphone thing. We're going to get you, as many of you, uh, before lunch to ask questions as you possibly can. Just because you're the closest, sir, I'm going to start with you and then I'm going to rove around the back. But um, the gentleman in about the fourth row back, there you go. Tell us who you are and give us your question for Jean-Claude. <coughs> Yeah, always a good idea to get rid of the chewing gum. Yeah, yeah. that was... It was a Ricola. <laughs> <laughs> Swiss. <laughs> chewing gum. No, uh, my name is Remo Haki. I'm heading uh, AEK Bank. And first of all, uh, with all the respect, thank you, uh, Mr. Jean-Claude Trichet, for being here. And congratulations for your achievements, uh, the work you did and the passion uh, you show. Now you know uh, comes a critical question. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, many people are saying that the markets are dysfunctional, but I don't think that the markets are dysfunctional. I think we just don't like the consequences. And um, isn't failure the best regulator and we all are trying to get rid of it? Right, interesting point. Shouldn't we allow failure and uh, recognize it and be honest about it? I think we, we have to do that, of course, and I think, obviously, we did that because uh, after the dramatic intensification of the crisis, we could all see that we had a level of uh, fragility that was not perceived ex ante. So we all had, if I may, to re-examine, and it has to be done by the authorities, it had to be done by the private sector. By the way, I mentioned en passant that the G30 has just published a study on improvement in corporate governance in the financial institutions as, you know, one of the consequences of what has been experienced in 08 and 09. But I have also to say that we don't understand fully even from the academic standpoint, and after all, we are in a university, and I call for academic to continue to work very actively to understand better why the system was proved so fragile uh, immediately after a single event, after a single event, relatively modest, Lehman Brothers, in one you know, part of the world, you had some kind of immediate, quasi-immediate changes of the behavior of the entire sphere. But do you, re you really feel it was one single event? I think so, yes. It was a single I mean, wasn't event. It, it, it was a but much more widespread uh, moment in which we realized that, you know, uh, leverage had gone mad, risk, yeah, no, risk no. had been completely it's misjudged. True. It's true. And, and debt, whether it be private debt or public debt, particularly in Europe, was just no, beginning uh, to. No, let's be cautious because uh -huh. you had. All right, I'll calm no, down. No, no, no. The, the debt question appeared a year and a half afterwards, the start of the debt question. At that time, it was really the financial institutions in the world and the real economy by way of consequence that proved incredibly fragile. I fully agree with you. There was good reasons, but those good reasons were not perceived ex ante. All right. And, well, uh, and, and forgive me, Jean-Claude. Forgive me. I, I think you gave a very fair answer to the gentleman, but I just want to get as many questions in yeah, as I can. Course, so, but but I, I agree yeah. on the fact that we, we have to understand better. We have to understand better, and I call again to work very actively on that because it is something which uh, we cannot accept, that the system would continue to prove as fragile as it is. It is the reason why we have introduced uh, a lot of new rules. 
which are all, uh, I would say, designed to permit the system to be less fragile. Right. But we all, all have to put our house in order, and particularly the governments. That's absolutely clear. Good. Yeah, we like rules. It's just whether they're adhered to that's the question. Uh, a lady in the middle on this side, and then a gentleman near the camera at the back. We'll take two at once. And as, as, as Lord Griffiths rightly said, brevity is much admired. Go on, uh, madam. Yep. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Ge Yang uh, from China, and I'm a leader of tomorrow. Uh, I have a question, because uh, you just mentioned about government. As we all know, right now, this year is the election year of the world. Uh, no matter of the United States president election, Russian, French, and as well as China. So I have a question for you is, uh, as government change sometimes will bring uncertainty and the risk. So what se most serious risk do you predict in may happen in the future? Do you have any suggestions to the current uh, monetary uh, policy makers? This is my first one, and second one is uh, well, very simple. I, you know what, I, it's a great question, but I'm going to stop you there. You're only allowed one. <laughs> Even in Switzerland, you can only have one question. Oh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so you, the second one is, well, you, have you... <laughs> Sorry, I have to continue uh, I, because uh, I'm very curious you, about on, that. No. Have you ever ever pay attention to the Chinese uh, RMB internationalization? I, I don't know if it's good or bad. People say many things. So I just wanted to what? hear about your 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 idea about that. Right. Uh, can no, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> Great okay, questions, you. but you've thank got you. to stop. You thank you very much, madam. You've got to stop. Thank you so much. Okay, thank so you. For, very briefly, Jean-Claude, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where do you see the greatest source of, of risk? What are you most worried about right now? And second of all, talk a little bit about the, the Chinese currency and the way forward that you see, the yeah. best way forward for the Chinese currency. Yeah. Well, f first of all, uh, as it, uh, it has been said very eloquently uh, previously, of course, a market economy cannot function without risk. Risk uh, uh, have to be taken, have to be accepted. And uh, I have also to say that we, we must perhaps distinguish between the risks that are uh, probabilized and that you can say there is a certain probability that this risk is materializing. And the, you have uncertainty, which is not to be probabilized, as Knight uh, said, and the Knightian uncertainty when you look at the work of, uh, of Knight, is very interesting because it is, for him, the kind of uh, justification of the profit of the entrepreneur in a market economy. It is precisely because the risk is not probabilized mm. that you have the profit of the entrepreneur. But I would say we have to expect to live with risks, and we have risks everywhere, and they can appear in a way which is not necessarily to be probabilized. So I would say prepare and try to have your system and your entity, your enterprise, your country as well prepared, as resilient as possible. Switzerland is resilient because Switzerland is well managed. And uh, as I said, Canada has proved that good management could make you resilient. Sweden has demonstrated the same. So let's be as keen on resilience as possible, knowing that in any case, the transformations that are going on in the world are so incredible, uh, not only the growth of uh, emerging countries, but science and technology. Technology is galloping, and the Moore law will continue to produce its effects over the next 20 years. And, and very on, briefly... On the second uh, point, yeah. I would only say that uh, the renminbi will progressively, in my opinion, become a major currency, a major currency which would be as, I would say, important as uh, are the dollar or the euro today. Give us a time frame. How long till the renminbi is, is a reserve currency in the way the dollar uh, I, is? I will pass the, the, the question to Governor Zhu, my friend, uh, the governor of the Central Bank of, of, uh, of China. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, unfortunately, he's not in the room. So you can say what you yeah. like and he won't hear you. No. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, let's get two more from the back. There's one right behind the camera and then one near the camera. Yeah, that gentleman there. No, no, that one, yep. Yeah. yeah, it's you. You're on. Go on. Mr. Touche, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Uh, my name is Martin Vladimirov and I'm from Bulgaria, a member country that 
doesn't use the euro. Um, my question, though, refers to um, your comment about house order. We need to bring order to our houses, but is it the right time to do it? And in this sense, was it a correct decision to increase interest rate in the midst of the biggest recession? Thank you very much. I think that you are, re you are referring to the... I, we did not increase rates uh, in uh, at the time of a recession. We did not do that. We, we did, did you that. Cut, did you cut at, them quickly enough? We did, we did that at times where uh, there was no recession. We did that also at times where there was a threat uh, of uh, uh, destabilization of our inflation expectations. And I have to say that all what we did, it seems to me, in uh, this very, very difficult period of time, permitted us to avoid any materialization of the inflationary risk, which is important, of course, because otherwise you have an increase of all nominal rates that are incorporating long-term, medium-term, the inflation expectations. But we also totally avoided any materialization of the deflationary risk, so that our inflation expectations, five-year tenures, were very close to 2% at 1.9 or 2%, which is... Uh, I trust the best way you have in very difficult waters. You, you mentioned the, <laughs> the terrible uncharted waters in which we are, we, we were and still are. And of course, it's very important that you have at least a solid anchor. The inflation expectations are that anchor. Okay. Um, right, one, one, one in the middle with your thingy raised, your um, translation kit. Where's the nearest microphone? No. Oh, oh, sorry, you've got, well, all right, we'll take two. You've got the microphone in your hand, so you go, and then we'll get this gentleman. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my name is Taejun Shin. Uh, I'm a Korean working in Japan. Um, <coughs> the, so the financial system is now more complex than before, and in some sense, it's actually beyond my imagination. So I just would like to ask a very simple, pragmatic, and positive question. Yeah. So what do you think is the best way or best the, uh, the action that people in this room can take immediately to alter the situation, the better. Thank you so much. People in this room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say the leader of tomorrow. Uh, they have to prepare for everything, as I said. And taking my own uh, experience, know that they will see things that are absolutely incredible today. I negotiated myself with uh, Mr. Gorbachev the rescheduling of the Soviet Union debt at, in the last days of Soviet Union. Uh, had I been told that there would be at a certain time more billionaires in dollars in Moscow than in New York, I would have said it's totally, totally incredible, impossible and so forth. So things are changing much more rapidly than we think. Prepare for these changes. And for all the CEOs that are there, I trust that uh, they are all doing all what they can to identify risk, put their house in order, not forgetting that risks are part of market economies, and uh, having confidence in the fact that, again, all the changes that we are observing and that are so difficult to manage are coming from successes. Technological and science success, and of course the uh, spreading of market economies as the right rule to create wealth all over the world, which is, of course, uh, at least in my eyes, a formidable success. All right. I think one key to success is making sure everybody has lunch. So uh, I think we'll have one more question. Yeah, you, you were very patient, so I'm going to turn to you. Sorry, everybody else. I know there are loads more questions, but you, sir. Uh, quick question. Uh, you had talked earlier about uh, Can you tell us who you are? Um, I'm Shiv, call from India. I live and work in India. And the question relates to your uh, comment about keeping inflation uh, anchored at 2%. Um, there's been several uh, academic uh, and non-academic arguments made for a higher target uh, as a way of uh, doing what you also talked about, which is uh, increasing competitiveness in uh, the Europe periphery, Spain, Ireland. Yeah. And... Uh, the, the main uh, resistance to the higher inflation anchors seems to come from the large economy. Indeed. So why, why should we uh, not have uh, a 4% inflation target? What is magical about 2%? And uh, 
And uh, is it really worth having 50% of uh, Spain under 25 unemployed, you well, know, at the cost of keeping I think it's, it's a very strong, strong question to finish with. And, and to use a rather vulgar metaphor, isn't it time that, you know, the ECB loosened the waistband on its trousers a little bit, allowed <laughs> itself to relax a little bit and focus more on growth and less on austerity, and a part of that may be learning to be a little more relaxed on inflation targets? Well, as you know, uh, we all have in the advanced economy now very, very close definition of price stability. In Europe, it is less than 2%, close to 2%. And if we had been ultra-orthodox, we would not have posted 2.03% over 13 years. It would have been much lower because we would have been ultra-orthodox, which was not the case. Again, we, had, we were extremely keen on being in line with our definition. In the United States of America, you might know that the definition of price stability is 2% or slightly less than 2 But do you reject the, 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 the proposition the in the question that no, to help uh, economies, particularly like Spain and, 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 and Greece and maybe others I at think, the moment? I think, if you permit, I think that the idea that you're better off with higher inflation is not true. It's not been proved by academia. It is a naive uh, I would say, view, to think that you arbitrage between price stability and growth. Uh, in Switzerland, nobody trusts that you get prosperity through inflation. Nobody would trust that. In all our economies, you don't convince the people on that. I can tell you that the people of Europe, the people of the euro area, but as well as the people of the uh, 27 countries, trust that they must have both price stability and uh, growth, of course, and uh, unemployment uh, going down. I don't want to uh, take always the same countries in example, but they were exemplary in terms of maintaining uh, price stability, uh, Switzerland or Germany, and they have gained a lot in terms of uh, employment and diminishing unemployment. So, but let me only conclude on that. If you would say, say that the US Fed or the ECB would say, from now on, our definition of price stability is not 2%, it is 4%. What would happen immediately? All nominal interest rates would incorporate the fact that the definition of price stability has changed, and you would be 2% higher immediately, all interest rates. Mm. And then you would have also a risk premium which would be incorporated in all inflation expectations and therefore in all nominal interest rates to take into account that if you had changed from two to four, you could also change from four to five or six or whatever. And we have the experience of very high inflation in the past. So you would do exactly what you do not want to do, namely creating an environment which would be less favorable to growth. So that's the reason why all central banks in the advanced economy have said, no, it's not a good idea. Well, but academia has to explore everything. And uh, oh. I mean, we are uh, in well, a marketplace where you have ideas that are floated. You have to select the good ones. And, uh, and I most, don't think clearly, it's a good most one. clearly that, in your view, is not a good <laughs> one. I think we, we understand that. Jean-Claude, I'm afraid to say that there are many more questions in the hall, but we have run out of time. Please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in giving a very warm thank you to Jean-Claude Fichet. Jean-Claude, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um,